All right, so last time we were also in John chapter 8, of course. Uh, the, the timing is it is the day after the last and great day of the Feast of Tabernacles where all of John chapter 7 took place. And here in John chapter 8, we're in the midst of a, a very direct confrontation between Jesus Christ and the Pharisees. And in it, we see the disconnects between God and fallen man. Uh, we see the contentions between God and fallen man. And so far, uh, we've seen those to be the, the truth of Jesus' witness. Uh, we've seen that regarding who the Father is. We've seen that regarding where Jesus came from. Uh, we saw it in the purpose of the Messiah. They're looking for a king. Uh, God sent a servant. And last week, we looked at the disconnect as it relates to freedom. And what is freedom and where do we find it? Uh, this time, the, the conversation, the confrontation, if you will, continues. But it's going to get personal and it's going to get a little testy at points. And the issues remain freedom and father. And as we go through this, as always, we need to read our Bibles carefully. We need to listen carefully to what Jesus is saying so that we understand what he's saying. All right, so we picked it up. We left off at verse 32, but we probably ought to get a run and start at this. So if we slide backwards to verse 30, and he spake these words, excuse me, as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? So the, the people there in the treasury of the temple, verse 20, they're in the treasury area of the temple. That's where uh, the free will offerings were put in collection boxes. Jesus is standing there teaching. It's, it's on the platform. It's a big platform. Uh, all the way back at the beginning of the chapter, we see many people came to hear him teach. They're still there. The Pharisees are there. And of course, Jesus is there. And so those uh, of the crowd that heard what he was saying, many of them believed on him. But the Pharisees here in verse 30, 33 take great exception to that. Uh, they don't believe that he is the Christ, that he is the son of the living God. Uh, they don't believe what he's just got done saying, including to those that have believed on him. And so they object. They say, we be Abraham's seed. Where are the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? You know, the chosen people, the ones to whom God gave the law and the prophets, his word, uh, We've never been in slavery to anyone. Isn't that what they say? We were never in bondage to any man. We were never anybody's slave. So where do you get off saying, ye shall be made free? Uh, we have the word of God. You just got done telling everybody that if they believed and continued in your words, they would be made free. They're not buying any of this. But wait a minute. We were never in bondage to any man. Really? How irrational is that statement? First of all, in the physical sense, uh, the people of Israel, their, almost their entire history comprises being oppressed and conquered by other people. It started in Egypt where they were formed a nation. And it's continued much of their history. Even that day, standing in the temple complex on that platform, they can look to the north. And what will they see? A Roman fort called Antonio's Fortress, guarding the, the northern side. It's in plain view. And who's in the Roman fort? Roman soldiers, not known to be nice people. And so there is evidence of a Roman occupation and a Roman oppression right where they're standing as they're saying these things. So it's a pretty irrational thing to say. But maybe, maybe they're understanding that what Jesus is speaking of is, is spiritual in nature. 
which makes their statement all the more irrational because to claim that the Jews were never in bondage to sin, that's ludicrous. Again, where are they standing? On a temple platform. Who built the temple? Herod. Why did Herod build that temple? To impress the Jews because they had a little temple there before. And why was there a little temple before there? Because Solomon's temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. Why was Solomon's temple destroyed? Because of idolatry by the people. So none of this makes any sense on on the surface. And so Jesus is going to test the things that they say. uh, And of course, with the word of God, which is the final authority. Verse 34. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. The first issue Jesus is going to address is the we've never been in bondage statement by the Pharisees. And he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, which means what? Thus saith the Lord. In the Old Testament prophets, they would say, thus saith the Lord, receiving the word of God. Well, the Son of God is standing. The one who gives the word, the living word, is standing there. Verily, verily, I say unto you. It's the same thing as thus saith the Lord. Uh, The word of God is our measure of truth. Uh, He goes on to say, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Whosoever commits sin. Who commits sin? Who doesn't? Everybody commits sin. The word of God given to King David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he wrote in Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. There are, they are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Psalm 14. Sounds familiar. That's because the Apostle Paul, also inspired by the Holy Spirit, quoted that in his letter to the Romans in chapter 3. Uh, the first three chapters of Romans is a bulletproof case that every man is a sinner. And it includes this quote. Oh, and it also includes uh, that we all all fall short of the glory of God. Uh, Well, not just David in Psalm 14, but Solomon, the son of David, when he's standing in that same general area after he had a temple built, is standing and he is praying and he's dedicating the temple. And in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46, it begins if about the people. If they sin against thee, for there is no man that sins not. And it goes on from there. Solomon, the son of David, praying to the Lord, acknowledges that every man sins. And the proof that Israel sinned is that, that his temple was destroyed after they fell into gross idolatry and the Lord sent the Babylonians to destroy the temple and to destroy the city. So, all men sin. Therefore, according to Jesus, whosoever committeth the sin is the servant of sin. Uh, Why does that make every person? Apart from... Apart from Jesus, when they're disconnected from God, fallen man, disconnected from God, is a sinner, is a slave to sin, every descendant of Adam. Moving on. Verse 35 says, And the servant, what servant? The servant of sin, right? You read, reading carefully, and the servant, which is a servant of sin, the servant abideth not in the house forever. What house? The house of God. The context is they're standing there in the treasury of the temple. They abide not. They live not in the house of God. They do not live in the presence of God. The temple was called God's house. Uh, that's was 
symbolic of where his presence was. Uh, and no sinner can live in the presence of God. Our sins have separated us from God. And so in the Father's house, where does the Father reside? In heaven. In eternity. In heaven, there are no slaves to sin. Right? Moving on. But the Son, the singular, exclusive Son, capital S, the Son. What Son? The Son of God. God incarnate. Uh, the Word of God that became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Uh, he's not like all men. All men are slaves to sin. The Son of God is not like all men. He is not a sinner. He's not a slave to sin. But the Son abideth ever. Where does the Son of God live forever? In the presence of God, where no sinners, where no slaves to sin reside. What is Jesus saying about himself? He's the Son of God, and he is without sin. He is sinless. Are you with me? It's really important to understand what Jesus is saying about himself so that we know who he is, and therefore we know where we are. We're either in him or we're not, depending on whether we put our faith in him or not. Therefore, knowing who he is is critically important. And he is saying that he is God the Son. He is the Son of God. And that he is without sin. He does not have the sin nature that you and I do. Verse 36 says, then, if the Son shall... If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. This is a follow-up to what he said in verses uh, 31 and 32. If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Slaves to sin cannot set themselves free. In, In the history of man where man has oppressed fellow man and enslaved them, including in our own country. Uh, There's always been slave rebellions, slave getting together and rebelling against the oppression of someone else. Slaves to sin, they don't rebel. First of all, they don't rebel against the sin. They like it. And secondly, if they could, it's impossible. They're in bonds that cannot be broken by man. Uh, And therefore, if they're to be made free from sin, meaning liberated, meaning delivered delivered from that slavery to sin, then they need a helper who's on the outside, who has no sin. That's the only way the slavery to sin can be broken. Uh, Slaves to sin cannot make themselves sinless. The filthy cannot make themselves pure. They need one to help them who is more powerful than sin. Someone like them, but not like them in that they don't have a sin nature and therefore are sinless. The kinsman redeemer. And all men are sinners, yet there must be a kinsman redeemer to redeem those who are in slavery to sin. And God promises a kinsman redeemer who in in Genesis chapter 3 is called the seed of the woman. God himself became a man to free people from slavery, slavery to sin. He's the only one who can and does do it. Uh, He makes sinners free. He makes sinners sinless. He gives them his nature to counteract theirs. 
and therefore the work of salvation, the work of redemption, uh, the work to cleanse is his work and his work alone. And here we are on the temple platform. The kinsman redeemer is in the midst of them and he's speaking to them face to face. And the religious leaders are arguing. But nonetheless, they made a statement. They said, we've never, we've never been in bondage to any man. Jesus tested that statement. And what are the test results? It's false. They fail. According to the word of God, what they said is completely false. So now he's going to address the other thing that they said, which was that they're descendants of Abraham. Verse 37. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which you have seen with your father. He goes, yes, I know that you're Abraham's seed. I know the bloodline. I know that you come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, But, in contrast to that, he says, you seek, ye seek to kill me. Jesus said in verse 24, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. Verse 28, he said, Then Jesus said unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak those things. Uh, He is standing in front of them, and so far twice in this conversation, in direct language that they understand, he has said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the voice in the burning bush. When Moses saw this bush that was not being consumed by the flame, he said, I have to see it, and he goes. And there was a voice that came out of the bush and said, Moses, take off your shoes. This is a holy place. I am the God of your father. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And later in the conversation, Moses said, well, who are you? What is your name? Who should I Tell the people in Egypt that, excuse me, that you're sending me. And Jesus said, I am that I am. And so he has said that. The God of Abraham is standing in front of them and they're claiming to be Abraham's descendants. But what they want, what do they want to do? They want to kill him. So by what they want to do and what they're striving to do, they're really kind of disowning their father Abraham. They're taking a a sharp swerve away from their father Abraham. Uh, And as it says at the end of verse 37, because my word has, my word, the truth, the truth that shall make you free, my word has no place in you. It cannot enter your hearts. Your hearts are hard, your hearts are blind. That my word cannot enter your minds because your minds are closed. Oh, and he already told them in, in verse 21. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me and shall die in your sins. Uh, their spirit is dead. They have the, the sin nature that comes from every descendant of Adam and Eve. Uh, And his word has no place in them. I speak, verse 30, I speak. Speak as whom? The true witness. In verses 13 through 18, that was the very first issue that they brought up with Jesus. You're just talking of yourself. You're you're a false witness. And you go, no, I'm the true witness. And so the true witness is speaking. I speak that which I have seen with my father. Seen. With his eyes, if you will, seen and experienced with, the Greek word is para, P-A-R-A. It means beside. In other words, I have seen in the presence of my father. Where is the father? He's in heaven. He inhabits eternity. Jesus is saying, I'm an eyewitness. 
of my Father. I'm an eyewitness of everything that's gone on in heaven. Uh, moving on then. I speak that which I have seen with my Father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your Father, just as I have done. What I have seen with my Father, you have done. What you do, your Father see. What, what you've seen your Father do. What is it they are trying to do? They're trying to kill him. They say they are Abraham's descendants, but they don't do as Abraham's descendants would do. There is a massive disconnect, not only between themselves and their God. There's a massive disconnect in their own hearts between what they do and what they say and what is real. What they do. We can say just about anything. What do we do? What we believe. So what they are doing is what they believe. And it's what they've seen their father do. Which will get developed as we keep moving. Verse 39. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me. They, they snap right back. It's getting testy. <laughs> they said, Abraham is our father. Well, the Lord's going to continue testing that statement. And he says, If ye were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Okay, well then what are the works of Abraham? Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. Genesis fifteen six. A year and a half ago, when he was in Jerusalem, people came to him and said, what are the works of God that we must do? And Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. The only work that is pleasing to God is that we believe. In Hebrews chapter 11, our corporate reading, some people call it the hall of faith. It's all about the, 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 the big names in the Bible and their faith. Much of it is about Abraham, his faith. Uh, more is written of him in Romans chapter 4, which we should read. This is the works of Abraham that Jesus is bringing to their attention. If you were the children of Abraham, then you would do the works of Abraham. Romans chapter 4, starting verse 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. That was a promise given to Abraham. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and called those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according so that he was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Promise was given to Abraham at what stage of his life? He's kind of old. He's 75. He would live to be 175. But nonetheless, uh, he and his wife, Sarah, were barren. And God says, I will make you a father of many nations. And he hoped. He believed in hope. Verse 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead uh, because now he's about 99. And he still doesn't have a son. They still don't have a son. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. And when he, he, he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of, he didn't doubt for a minute that God said what he said, and he's able to do what he said. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Did he understand how he could become the father of many nations? No, he did not understand. That would be knowledge. He didn't have knowledge. He had faith. God said it. He knows how he's going to do it. That's all I need to know. Verse 21, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. That's the work of Abraham. 
to believe God and then to be accounted as righteous. And so back in John chapter 8, after the Pharisees have claimed that they're Abraham's children, Jesus said, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. You would believe God. But they don't. They don't believe the testimony of God regarding the Messiah. They don't believe the Son of God who's standing there as a witness in front of them. But now you seek to kill me. You do not do as Abraham, i.e. you do not believe, quite the opposite, you seek to kill me, and therefore you, not, you are not as you say. You are not Abraham's children. The, the very evidence of their lives, the, the evidence of their words, and the motives of their heart, which Jesus does know, say a completely different story. But now you seek to kill me, a man, a man, seed of the woman, kinsman redeemer, the word of God made flesh that has told you the truth. He's given them a lot of truth just in this conversation, much less all the other things he said leading up to this point in his ministry. Uh, I have told you the truth, which I have heard of God. Remember, I have seen. He's been in the presence of. He's been with God. He's not only an eyewitness of what God has done and said, he's an ear witness. He's heard it. Double-fold witness. A man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This, this what? Seeking to kill me. <laughs> this did not Abraham. Abraham didn't attempt to kill me. Abraham no, had no desire whatsoever to kill me. He wanted to come close. He believed what I said. You don't. You're not like your father Abraham. You're not his children. You have a different father. So, the statement that the Pharisees, the self-righteous Pharisees have said, stating, proclaiming that they're Abraham's children, how does that match up? It's false. True of a bloodline. We're not talking bloodline. Clearly, we're not talking bloodlines. Uh, what they're claiming to be is not true. Verse 41 continues. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Uh, because you cannot hear my word. So what happened in the conversation here? It got a little uglier. The Pharisees just got ugly. Uh, they say to Jesus, we be not born of fornication. Fornication. Sexual relations between a man and a woman outside the legal parameters whereby that's given, and that is only given in marriage. It's a sexual sin that God is highly offended by because it speaks of a greater rebellion, the spiritual rebellion against him. And they, the Pharisees, seem to think they know the history of Jesus' conception. And they are accusing Jesus of being born of fornication. What are they saying about his mother and his father? Well, first of all, they've got the wrong father. What are they saying about his mother? They're calling her a whore. Uh, what are they saying about the father? Well, the father is either Joseph and he knew Mary before the consummation of the marriage, which according to the word of God is bad enough, or the father is another man. Not Joseph, but another man. 
Maybe that's why Joseph wanted to divorce her. Could be what they're thinking, if they knew that. Uh, This is the ugliest, the uglier of the two scenarios. You wonder where they're going to drift. We have, at the end of verse 41, we have one father, God. What are they saying? I think they're ticking the uglier of the two scenarios regarding Jesus's, what they think to be Jesus's conception. It wasn't Joseph. It was another man. So Jesus tests that statement about their father and his conception. He says in verse 41, Where am I? Verse 42, rather. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, what does Jesus do with that insult? You were born of fornication. What does he do with that insult? Nothing. Nothing. Let's go. But there's a statement there about his father that's not correct. And he does speak to correct that then. If God were your father, as you said, you would love me. The word love in the Greek is agape. It is that selfless, selfless, sacrificial love, the denial of self for the benefit of someone else. God has for us. God demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If God were your father, you would love me. And of course, there's, he's speaking to them in Greek, I would imagine. Maybe not, maybe Hebrew. But these words are written in Greek. And that's the word for love. Well, they, they don't love him, do they? <laughs> and so there is a disconnect between the father that does love them, that God that does love love them, love him, and they who do not love him. If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth, I issued from, I departed from, and came from, I arrived from. I departed from God, I arrived from God. Neither came I of myself, but he that sent me. He departed from God the Father who inhabits eternity. I came from heaven. I came here from heaven. And I didn't come of my own will. I came for my Father's will. I came to fulfill the words of my Father. I am the one who was born of a virgin, whose name is Emmanuel, which means God with us in fulfillment of, of the Messianic scripture, Isaiah 7, 14. My name is Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, in fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. I came from everlasting. I came from eternity, fulfilling Micah chapter 5, verse 2. I am the Lord whom David calls his son. David said to the son of David, Lord. In fulfillment of Psalm 110, verse 1. As we talked last week. Yes. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob gave his law, gave his words to the Jewish people. And it included promises of the seed of the woman, the kinsman redeemer that would come to make them free from the slavery to sin. And he told them in advance, this piece, this piece, this piece, this piece, as they connected the pieces together so that they would recognize their Messiah when he came. And they have not. Verse 43, why do you not understand my speech? Understand, to know absolutely, without question, without doubt. Why do you doubt? Why do you question? Why 
Do you not believe? Uh, because you cannot hear my word. My words cannot enter your hard hearts and your closed minds. Because you don't believe the testimony of God that he's given to you in his words that are written for you to read and to study. And because you don't believe, it's not accounted unto you as righteousness as it was with Abraham. And we know that apart from faith, it is impossible to please God. So, the Pharisee said that Jesus was born of fornication and God is their father. Jesus has tested that statement. Uh, what are the test results? Again, false. <laughs> they have failed the test. Well, who is their father? If Abraham is not their father, if God is not their father, who is their father? Jesus answers that question. Verse 44, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now, the Pharisees got real ugly with Jesus when he, they accused him of being born of fornication, calling him a bastard, calling his mother a whore. Pretty nasty, ugly things. Is Jesus getting ugly with them? No. No. He's still testing their proclamations that Abraham is their father and that God the Father is their father. Uh, No, he says, your father is the devil. In verse 23, earlier in the conversation, he had said to them, ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. Again, I came from heaven. I came from eternity. I'm not worldly. I'm not of the world. Uh, He told them right there that they're children of the world. That's not a compliment. It's a reality, but it's not a compliment. Now he says to them that they are children of the devil. And the lusts of your father ye will do. What's the lust of the devil? To kill, destroy. What are they trying to do to Jesus? To kill and to destroy. Uh, The lust of the father ye will do. He... Lucifer, Satan, the devil, he was a murderer from the beginning. All the way back to the garden in Genesis chapter 3, a murder took place. Even though no blood was shed, a murder took place. Because Adam and Eve, believing the deception of the slanderer, the liar, the murderer, disobeyed God and the light went out. They were clothed in light. The light went out. Found themselves naked. Were ashamed. Made fig leaf clothes and tried to hide. Their fellowship with God ended. The spirit died. And they now had a new nature. A sin nature. That was murder. That's one attributed to Lucifer. What happened in the next chapter? Genesis chapter 4. This time blood was shed. Cain and Abel, right? Cain and Abel, jealousy. And to this day when Jesus is speaking and to this day when we're sitting here, Satan is still a murderer and he is still has this blood lust and he still has a very special interest in one group of people in particular. Who would that be? The Jews. The bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because from that bloodline comes the seed of the woman that will destroy him. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. He rejected the truth. He didn't believe God's testimony. You can read in Isaiah 14 and then Ezekiel 28, the heart of Satan. He wants to be God. He wants to be worshipped as God. Uh, He is at war against God. And so he does not believe the truth of God. 
Therefore, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. He speaks of his will, not God's will, his will. He has his words, not God's words, but his words. The, 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 the danger, he knows scripture better than any one of us ever will. And he can twist it just a little bit to make it a lie, to make it lethal. He knows the word of God, but he alters it, adds to it, takes away from it, twists it to make it lethal. He is a liar, the father of it. If Jesus is speaking, excuse me, if the devil is speaking, what's he saying? A lie. If Jesus is speaking, what's he saying? The truth. How are we to discern the truth from the lie? Know the truth. That's what's been given to us for. Uh, Satan is anti-truth personified. Jesus is the word of God that's become flesh. Uh, and the Pharisees do not believe the testimony of Jesus who has spoken to them the truth. They do believe the testimony of the devil, which is a lie. Therefore, they are not the children of God. Therefore, they are not the children of Abraham. They are the children of the devil because they do as their father does. The child does as his father does. Uh, And that makes them liars. How much, by the way, how much lie is required to make a truth not true? What if a statement, a sentence... A paragraph is 99% true. Just 1% lie. Is it true or is it a lie? It's a lie. If you don't have one, and I don't know why you would, uh, but you can go online and look at the New World Translation, which is the Bible of the Jehovah's Witnesses, and go to John 1, 1. We know it. In the beginning, well, let's look at ours. Then I'll tell you what theirs says. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Pretty clear. What does the New World Translation say? Uh, Everything except there's another word added between the last two. A single letter, a. So their translation reads, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was a God. Just one letter? Is it true or or false? It's a lie. One percent lie makes a lie. And we're, we're told in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist. He denieth the Father and the Son. And the Apostle Paul would write to a church at Corinth that was entertaining a whole bunch of these people. And he would say to them that they are false apostles. They are deceitful workers. They're transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. He's not an angel of darkness. He's an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness. 99% truth is a lie. And The lie is sourced from the devil. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. Verse 45, Jesus continued, Because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Because I tell you the truth. Things that he has seen, 
He's an eyewitness. The things that he's heard, he's an ear witness. He's come from eternity. He says, I am the self-existent God. I tell you the truth. But their hearts are hard and blind. Their minds are closed. They don't believe who Jesus says quite clearly in their hearing who he is. They just don't believe the testimony of God. Either God the Father or God the Son, both of whom are true witnesses speaking to them. Uh, What they've done instead with their own human reasoning, with their own agenda, which is corrupt, and with their own traditions and belief, they have perverted the word of God, and in so doing, they've disowned, whether obviously they don't think so, but they've disowned Abraham uh, in favor of Satan. Because his testimony of Jesus, they believe that. They believe that. They're listening to their father, but they're not listening to the father. So Jesus has a challenge for them. Which of you convinces, uh, convicts, rebukes me of sin? Can you prove that I'm not qualified to say what I said in verses 34 and 35? Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. Can you prove that I'm not qualified to say that? Well, were there any takers that day? No. And there aren't any takers this day either. Why not? (laughs) Because Jesus is who he says he is. He is sinless. He is without sin. He is God the Son. He is the Son of God. He is absolutely unique. He is light in whom there is no darkness at all. Verse 46, and if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? What a question is that? That's a really important question. If I say the truth, if you can't convince me that I'm a liar, if, if I'm speaking the truth and search the scripture to see if it's true, if I speak the truth, why don't you believe me? Only a foolish person would not believe the truth. Why do you not believe me? He that is of God hears God's words. The Pharisees do not hear, do not receive, do not understand what Jesus is saying because they don't believe it. Yet Jesus is saying the words that the Father gave him to say. So, Jesus is telling them straight up. If you hear God's words, you're of God. You are of the Father. You belong to God. If you receive his testimony, to receive is to believe. Just like Abraham, he believed God and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. Those who receive, who hear God's words are of God, belong to God. But ye therefore, because you don't, you hear them not because you are not of God. They don't belong to God. They don't receive God's testimony. They don't believe it. So they don't belong to God. They belong to the one whose word, whose testimony they do receive. They belong to the devil. Verse 48. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? They hit right back. They hit right back. But did they take Jesus up on his challenge? They did not. They ignored it. The dodge. Let's change the subject. And what they give instead, how they respond, is another personal insult. And another blasphemy. Uh, They had already said, we'd be not born of fornication, which is what you have been born of fornication. 
And now when we add it to this, have we not well said that thou art a Samaritan? Who are they saying his father is? A Samaritan. Not Joseph. Another man altogether. They went back to the same personal insult toward him and, and toward his mother and toward the word of God. Uh, and then they say, well, you have a devil. That's blasphemy. Matthew chapter 12, they've already done that. <laughs> this is the second time they're doing it. Verse 49, Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father and ye do dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and judges. Uh, Jesus hears their statement. He tests their statement. Uh, And once again, just like he did the first time, Jesus ignores the personal insult. He didn't come here for his glory. He didn't come for his honor. He came for the Father's glory, the Father's honor. Say what you will about me. He will not respond. But you attack my father, you attack the honor of my father, we have something to talk about. And so he does. He says, I have not a devil. How, how would they know that he doesn't have a devil? Because he doesn't do the works of the devil. He's not trying to seek and to destroy. He's doing the work of God. The fruit. Examine the fruit. You know what kind of tree by the fruit. Examine his words, examine his life, all the healings, all the miracles. That's not devilish. The devil wants to kill and to destroy. What he's doing, been doing is the work of God. He says, but I honor my father. How, he honors his father by doing what the father sent him to do and by saying the words the father sent him to say. As is evidenced by the word of God that they already have. They can search the scripture to see if the things that he's saying, the things that he's doing is true. He said, but I honor my father, but ye do dishonor me by not believing my testimony, by not believing the testimony of the father that he gave me and by trying to kill me. To not believe Jesus is to dishonor him and to dishonor the one who sent him. As opposed to what is the work of God that we might have eternal life? To believe. To believe on him whom he has sent. And in 1 John five ten, we read that he that believeth not God has made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. If you don't believe Jesus, you're calling God a liar. Because the father gave the words to the son to say, And he faithfully did so. To not believe what Jesus said about himself, is kind of the the context here in this chapter, to not believe what Jesus said about himself is to call God a liar. Jesus lets it go at that. He says, I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeks and judges. Uh, And we'll hear him pray in John chapter 17. He doesn't say it at this time. He doesn't say it to them. They don't believe. He's not going to waste his breath. But in John chapter 17, when he is praying to the Father and the 11 that are still with him hear him, uh, John 17, starting in verse 1, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this, is, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou, excuse me, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I didn't come for my glory, for my honor. I came for the glory and the honor of my father. And he sees and he's going to judge. Uh, So, this statement by the self-righteous Pharisees about Jesus being born of fornication and having a demon. What are the test results? False. Not true. 
Not true whatsoever. And as the Apostle Paul would be inspired to write us in Romans chapter 3, let God be true and every man a liar. So what do we do with this part of the conversation that Jesus has with the Pharisees? Well, there are a couple of takeaways that we need imprinted on our hearts. Number one is that every man serves someone, right? No man, no person is the Lord of their own life. Everybody serves somebody. And there's really only two choices. Either we serve the God, our creator, who is a benevolent master, who loves us as he proved to us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He gives us an easy yoke. And he wants to make us free from the slavery of sin. That we would willingly serve him. We serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Or we serve sin, self, Satan. Wrap it all together. Because it is all together. And sin... And self and Satan is a cruel, lying, murderous taskmaster seeking only one thing, the death of the slave. So we're either a slave to the devil or we are a willing servant of the God who set us free from that slavery. That's it. We're not Lord of our own lives. But we have a choice to make. Who am I going to serve? The other thing that we need to have imprinted on our hearts is this thing of spiritual pride. These Pharisees are, they've got the worst form of pride. It's the spiritual variety. It's the one that's closest to the devil. It's the one that is closest to that slippery slope from which there could possibly be no return. Spiritual pride is the ugliest of all things. And we need the Spirit of God to examine us in our walk with Him. Is is there something about us where we're haughty and self-righteous as opposed to humble and meek as Jesus was? Uh, A third thing that we take away from this passage of Scripture is, is hearing, is understanding. We all have ears, so we hear, but that doesn't necessarily mean understanding, because to have understanding, one must believe, and to believe or to not believe is a choice. So hearing really is a choice. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, not having all the information, not having all the answers. Having faith. And in the context of this conversation, having faith in one who's more powerful than sin. Having faith from someone who's outside my slavery who can break those chains and make me free. A fourth thing that we can take from this passage of Scripture is to be part of being Christ-like. Back on the Sermon on the Mount, what are we told to do? Turn the other cheek. To be Christ-like is to turn the other cheek. What did Jesus in this passage do with the personal insults? Nothing. Didn't even acknowledge them. As if they bounced right off. He didn't hold it and lash out in kind. He didn't hold on it and, and, and store it up and become bitter and then seek revenge. It just bounced right off. Because he didn't come for his glory and for his honor. He came for the glory and the honor of the Father. So you might say it didn't matter what they said about him. It matters what you say about my Father. And so it should be with us as we are his witnesses by the power of the Holy Spirit upon us sharing the light in the darkness of the world. Guess what? We're going to get insulted. Don't take it personally. Because who are they really, as as the the bulletin thing, who are they really upset with? Jesus. That's between them and Jesus. It's not between them and me. 
I don't care what they say about me. I care what they say about Jesus. So we'll stand on that. Stand on him. Stand on the honor of our Lord. We have no honor. We shouldn't get all hot and bothered when people insult us. So finally, overarching all of this, of course, and not just this passage of Scripture, but all of John chapter 8, all of Scripture itself, we have to know who Jesus is. Who is he? He's God incarnate, the Word that is God, the Word that became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And he is perfect. He is sinless. He's without sin. He has the power to break the chains of our slavery. And he has the heart and the desire to do just that, which is why he went to the cross to pay for it all. If we would just bend our knee and confess with our tongue that he is the Christ, the Son, and the living God, the chains of the slavery to sin are broken. Jesus is our kinsman, redeemer. We must be redeemed by sin, from sin, by someone of Adam's race. Because it was Adam and Eve that started this whole thing anyway. Someone from Adam's race has to make right, which was made wrong. And then, therefore, this this mystery of Jesus. He's 100% God. And he's 100% man. That seems, to the human reasoning, preposterous. But we receive it by faith. And when we believe God is accounted unto us as righteousness, we're acceptable, we're pleasing to God when we believe God's testimony of who Jesus is. And when we believe it, We become made free from sin. We get reconnected to our creator and our mind and our heart. Everything gets reoriented again, but that takes time. We have to make sure that we renew our mind, that we're transformed by the renewing of our mind, and that comes by the word of God and believing every word of it. It's God's work to break the chains of sin. It's God's work to conform us into the image of his son. It's our work to believe. And to believe is to do. To believe is obey. By faith. If I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? That's the scariest question I've read in a very long time. If I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? Well, Jesus has spoken the truth. Do we believe him? That's on us individually. I do. I want to believe it more. Just like the the man who cried out to Jesus because his son was demon-possessed. Jesus said to him, you know, God can do this you just have faith oh Lord I believe help my unbelief that's the process we're all in we're works in progress there's parts of our being our lives where we absolutely positively without doubt without question we believe this but then there's other parts where we have doubts. We don't quite believe. We don't quite understand. We want to understand before we believe. Well, we're not going to understand until we believe. And so our unbelief needs help. (laughs) And Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, is there to help. Spend time with him in the word, in prayer. Let him do through the word and by his spirit, what is he wants to do? And it will be for the glory of our Father. It will be for his glory. And of course, it's for our good. Amen? So if you'll stand with me, please.
Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this highly contentious conversation that's recorded for us in John chapter 8. When we read it carefully, we, we hear quite clearly what Jesus is saying. He's saying that he is God. He's saying that he's the son of God. Unbelievers say that Jesus never said he was God. He said it over and over and over. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you for making us free. Breaking these horrible chains of sin and self, whereby we serve the devil, thinking we were pleasing ourselves, but being miserable all the while. Doing the work of the one who's trying to kill us. Thank you for breaking those chains. Thank you for making us free. Thank you for giving us the measure of faith whereby we can invest it in Jesus Christ. Help, Lord, write these things on our hearts that as we go forth from here, we would walk in them, that we would grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are thankful for the good work that you started in us to conform us into the image of your dear Son. Lord, help us to obey because we're the inhibitor in that work. We thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for the long suffering toward us. Be glorified in all these things, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.